Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John Adams Institute at Pockhuis de Zwijger. Another great evening of the John Adams Institute, if you forgive me for saying so myself. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of the John Adams, which is a wonderful thing to be because then you get to host people like Branko Milanovic with a moderator like Kasper Tomas. So I feel very privileged and I'm glad that you've all come to join us here this evening. What does the John Adams actually do? In brief, our mission is to bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands. And I think we have a, a good exemplar with us this evening. Although, how American are you actually, Branko? Not really that oh. <laughs> But I do Oops. have green card. <laughs> he has a green card. Well, I guess that makes you a sort of honorary American, <laughs> as I am an honorary Dutch person. <laughs> um, Branko Milanovic is an economist specializing in inequality and globalization, and therefore also in global inequality. His new book, Global Inequality, translated by Publishing House Spectrum as Wereldwijde Ongelijkheid, is here for its Dutch launch this evening. Uh, this is in happy collaboration with Pakhuis Zwijger. We love being here. I think it's such a cool venue, and they have these gorgeous screens, and I think it's just a delightful place. So we enjoy being here very much. Our moderator this evening is Kasper Thomas, and he has news, which I am now going to give away. Spoiler alert. Kasper Thomas uh, is an editor at De Groene Amsterdammer, but as of September, he's moving to Washington to become the American correspondent for both De Groene Amsterdammer and the Financiële Dagblad. So the American connections are closer and closer. <laughs> Congratulations, Kasper. And I would now like to give the floor to you for your introduction to this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And once again, a warm welcome here and Pakhuis de Zwijger on behalf of the John Adams Institute. My name is Kasper Thomas. I'm indeed an editor at the Groene Amsterdammer. And I'm very honored to be standing here tonight as the convener of this evening. And we'll be talking actually on what is surely one of the most pressing global issues of our time, the gap between the fortunate and the unfortunate, between those who manage to climb the ladder of income and, and, and capital and those whose journey upwards halts almost immediately. And on this topic, on the winners and losers of globalization, Mr. Branko Milanovic, one of the world's most renowned economists, will enlighten us further tonight. And as you all know, every political conversation, no matter how big or small, has issues that are left unmentioned. There's always a perspective not chosen because it conflicts with dearly held convictions. Or is that there's this uncomfortable fact that is rather ignored because it might not fit with the argument. And I'm happy to speak, be speaking here in English tonight. Otherwise, I would have struggled with a clumsy Dutch translation of what is in English so beautifully known as the elephant in the room. Inequality for a long time was such an ignored topic, at least as far as the general public was concerned. The dominant idea in political economy was that a rising tide would simply lift all boats. The fact that some boats rode much faster than others, or that some boats had so many holes in them that they almost sank, was considered to be less important in policy circles. And if anything, wealth would just trickle down. Even if the rich got richer, the money that they spent would somehow end up in other people's pockets. Just a question of how many other pockets, or whose pockets exactly, was less discussed. It is the task of intelligent women and men to poke holes in such assumptions and to point out these uncomfortable facts. Mr. Branko Milanovic, who has devoted his career to studying inequality, is such a person. He first studied income inequality in the 1980s as a doctoral researcher in his native Yugoslavia. He then joined the World Bank, where for over 20 years he worked as lead economist studying the distribution of wealth and income between the rich and the poor. The multiple books and countless papers he has published during the past decades in which globalization has come to its, to its full growth, you could say, and he has consistently pointed out how and why inequality grows under those conditions and under what circumstances something can be done about it. More recently, he joined the City University of New York and the Luxembourg Income Studies Group to further work on income inequality, globalization, and global equity. 
This way, Mr. Milanovic forms the heart of a network of global thinkers that concerns itself with one of the most foundational questions of the economic discipline. How scarce prosperity ends up being divided in a world full of individuals that all try to get as big a share of the pie as possible. And I mentioned economics, but this immediately shows how questions of money are inextricably linked to questions of power, politics and geography. Mr. Milanovic, and that's what makes his work so intriguing to read, he actually fully exploits those linkages between economics and other disciplines. I'll give you a quote. Reading about global inequality is nothing less than reading about the economic history of the world, as Mr. Milanovic writes. And indeed, taking stock of his work makes you understand how historical trajectories shape economic outcomes and how political struggle lies at the basis of achieving a more just division of the world's riches. And this makes him, and here I leave behind the commitment to equality for a brief moment, it makes him belong to the global 1% of thinkers on this topic. Over the last few years, the issue of inequality has found its way to the public agenda. In addition to Mr. Milanovic's work, Occupy Wall Street, the movement that protested in the name of the 99%, and also the work of Thomas Piketty have contributed to this. As you, many of you might know, the French writer Victor Hugo said that no army can stop an ID whose time has come. He said it in French, but I've translated it for the purpose. And that, and that is true, but for that moment to arrive, an ID has to be maintained, nurtured and honed until its moment is finally there. And in the case of rising inequality, under conditions of global capitalism, Mr. Milanovic is the one who has committed himself to this important task. It was he who directed the eyes of the broad public to Thomas Piketty's work a public which subsequently discovered a whole treasure trove of studies on inequality that was already there for policymakers and journalists to draw on. This body of work was for a large part put together by Branko Milanovic himself. Global inequality, a new approach for the age of globalization, is Mr. Milanovic's most recent book. It is also what has brought us together here tonight. I will not say too much about it now, um, except that it brings the discussion of inequality right where it should be. In an age of globalization and migration, it's only natural that we discuss these disparities in income and capital in a global perspective. And it's not just the differences within countries that matter, but also the differences between countries. Because just as in previous episodes of globalization, today a global class system has emerged. Today we see the rise of a super-rich jet set with lives and capital that are not bound to a particular place. There's a global middle class, of which the lower rungs just about manage to make ends meet. And the poor that fall behind, a group whose geographical spread no longer neatly coincides with East-West division. In his book, Mr. Milanovic draws attention to these new fault lines and what the current wave of globalization means for these economic disparities between people. He does so again by presenting an elephant, not just in the room, but also in the Department of Statistics. His famous curve, a famous income curve that resembles an elephant with an upturned trunk, tells the story of globalization today and of a new alignment between different parts in the world. And this way, Mr. Milanovic raises important moral and political questions that are directly relevant to us here today. To whom do we own the obligation to spread our wealth? What room is there for global politics to prevent inequality from growing to unsustainable levels? And what is the responsibility of the individual for this worldwide inequality? This and more I hope to discuss with him tonight and also with you, the audience. And I'll very quickly explain how we are going to do that. Um, in a minute, I'll invite Mr. Milanovic up to the stage um, to share his thoughts and ideas with us. Um, afterwards, the two of us will sit down for, for, for a few questions. Um, there will be mics standing in the, uh, in, in the aisles. And sort of at, at, at some point during our conversation, I would like you to maybe start already thinking of your questions and. Um, line up at the mics, I'll, 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 I'll tell you when, and indeed uh, uh, ask a question. And then in the end, um, after, after the interview is done, we'll come back to you, to the audience again, for some more Q&A. Um, just a brief note on those questions, while you start thinking about them, indeed make them into a question. Um, so, say with a question mark at the end. If you, if you, if you remember, then all, then, all, then all should be fine. But, but I'm sure you, you'll, you'll, you'll manage. Um, that's it for me for now, Mr. Mlanovic. Can I invite you up to the stage to come and address us? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Obviously, it is an honor and pleasure to be here.
I would like, of course, to thank uh, Tracy uh, and Casper for a you know, beautiful introduction that they have given. It would be hard to live up to such introduction, so I will try maybe whatever, 50% of the introduction, to live up to 50% of the introduction. And of course, I would like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I know that it is a, a Thursday evening before a very long weekend. Uh, is not maybe the most propitious time to actually talk about inequality, so I'm very appreciative of everybody who has come here. And I hope that in my presentation and of course our discussion afterwards that actually you do find it worthwhile, you know, I mean, you're, you would validate your decision to spend this evening talking about inequality and globalization. So let me go, I will go through the slides. I'm probably, I'm, I mean, certainly will not cover all the slides, obviously, I have to say that the book is richer than you would, what you would hear tonight, because obviously I have to go over some parts of the book only. So let me start with, uh, of course, this is the English version of the book, and this is the Dutch version of the book, as you, I mean, you can see it outside, obviously. Uh, let me just start with first the, the definition. I know it's boring, but really we need to know what we are talking about. So let me start with the definition of what I mean and what is meant by global inequality. Uh, global obviously means that it covers the entire world. Inequality is very specifically used in the book uh, and in my uh, uh, presentation tonight as inequality in terms of income. So it is really rich and poor in terms of income and it is also calculated based on family incomes which are divided by the number of people who live in that household or that family. And it is also, very important point, adjusted by the price levels between the countries. Because I want to mention that simply because we know that price level in Norway, for example, is many times higher than the price level in India. So if we were to actually not adjust for the differences in price levels, we would mistakenly underestimate the incomes in India. So in order to avoid that, we use household survey data from, I will show you later, from something like 120 countries in the world. And each sort of survey is being adjusted by the price level of that country. I mention that because I often get questions of the nature like uh, how can you compare you know, incomes in India with incomes in the United States, in Gabon and in Russia and, and you know, uh, China, but you do that by the means of adjustment for the price levels. Now, it is not something that I have invented. It is something that has been used for years, and it is the result of very large, probably the largest empirical project in economics, which is called International Comparison Project, that every six, seven years actually does that kind of assessment of price levels. So that's one part of the massive database that one has to use. The second part is having access to household surveys from as many countries in the world as you can obtain. And there I was, of course, lucky to have been for 20 years in the World Bank Research Department, which actually does have probably still the best access to such surveys in the world. And that's the unit that produces, many of you, of course, have, are familiar with that, that produces the famous, uh, what used to be $1 per day uh, per person, on uh, po absolute poverty line, and um, uh, that is very often quoted in newspapers, but very few people worked that actually to be quite honest, other than myself, maybe one or two other people worked on inequality because it was a topic uh, that, uh, you know, in the 1980s or 1980s was not very popular, unlike poverty, so inequality was a little bit of a uh, topic left aside and maybe only some enthusiastic, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, people who were like myself, enthusiastically interested in inequality were working on that. But the data were indeed there. So this is for the definitions. Now, when you take this global inequality, you can divide it, strictly speaking, into inequality within countries and inequalities between countries. And this is going to play quite a role in what I'm discussing today. And to give you an idea what it really means, is that you, if I were to take this room and divide it into three parts, I could calculate inequality within, uh, within this particular part, with that second, the, the central part, and this other part of the room. Uh, so that would be the within within national, in my case, or in this case, within room inequalities of the three parts. 
But then there is a second component, which is very important for the world, is that there could be that one group of people is generally richer than the other group of people. So you have to then to take the average income of that group, compare with average income of this group, and compare with average income of this group. So that would be a different sort of a take on inequality. So the first one would be within Netherlands, within the US, within France, and so on, all added up somehow with weights of population. And then the second one, would compare the mean incomes between all countries in the world. So it would be China versus all the other countries, the Netherlands versus all the other countries. But as you can see, this is a different type of inequality. And only when you put them together, then you get the global inequality. So this is kind of a little bit, maybe, uh, how should I say, a little bit abstract, but in, uh, I hope, in a uh, my presentation, it will become less so, and it will become more intuitively uh, sort of understandable. Now, let me start with, with the national inequality. So basically here, in this couple of maybe four slides in the beginning, I will not talk about global. I will just talk about what is happening within individual countries. So what has happened over the you know, last uh, 50 years, and certainly since, up, uh, since early 1980s, is this on the vertical axis you see what is called the Gini coefficient, which is the measure of inequality. So if you just uh, uh, focus on this recent period, this is actually the, the average Gini coefficient in different countries in the world. This is all put together, and it's not always necessarily the same countries, because sometimes countries you know, are in the sample, sometimes not. But I want just to point out that there was this tendency towards rising inequality from 1980s to about early 2000s. It's not a surprise because it's basically why many of you are here tonight, because that issue has become really a big issue of our time, and it has become a big issue of our time because in most countries in the world, mostly rich countries to start with, like UK, the United States, and even continental Europe, and then countries like India, China, Russia, uh, South Africa, uh, inequality has been on the rise. So this is something that we do know, and we, it's also interesting that in the most recent period, uh, including the global financial crisis, we don't see that rise anymore. I will talk the, probably about that in the Q, in the Q and A part, uh, because uh, we are very aware of, of inequality now, but actually in the last seven years or so, we are actually seeing essentially the plateauing of inequality with changes within uh, you know, each nation state in some direction, but not a uniform increase that we have seen in the 1980s and the 1990s. So uh, this is essentially the same thing. I will not read all the things, but essentially what it shows is that the average Gini coefficient, which is measure of inequality, went up from something like 36 points to 38 points, which is a significant change because these are, this is like a little bit like watching grass grow. You don't have measures of inequality jumping up. They are actually, in order to have this Gini coefficient go by one point, you have really to have quite a lot of uh, change in the underlying distribution. And this uh, shows the same thing. It is, uh, this is actually just a reminder for me when I uh, redo this graph, so it has nothing really with uh, the audience, and unfortunately I don't know how to place it in a more elegant way, but it's essentially a code for me not to have to reinvent each graph uh, you know, on an annual basis. But, to, so, but what it does, actually, it shows you the countries that are above this line are the countries with an increase in inequality over the last, you know, 15 or 20 years. And you would recognize them, of course, they are also, uh, the, the size of the dot represents the size of population. So what the, actually this graph tends to show, and the objective is to, to show you that it's really large countries like China, India, United States, Nigeria, Russia, and Indonesia also, that have had an increase in inequality. Now, it matters for the global inequality more that large countries are becoming more unequal. Because if small countries become more unequal, it's an interesting observation, and it's, of course, an important issue for those countries. But small countries are not going to influence global inequality the way that China or India influence it. And when I come in a minute to global inequality, I would like you just to actually sort of, in, the intuition should be to look at the relationship between the rich world, which is essentially half a billion people in the European Union, plus 300 million people, or maybe 350 million people in North America, versus India and China. Because that interaction between India, China, and the West is really something which is largely determining what happens to global inequality. 
However, uh, uh, the, the, the reaction of different countries to this within national inequality has not been the same. And I show it here with this graph, which uh, shows you the, the red line. If you focus on the red line, the, the red line, I have it for the US and Germany here. The red line is something which is called market inequality. And that's the inequality before government redistribution through transfers or taxes. Now, why this graph, I think, is interesting, because it shows you first that each country had to face an underlying increase in inequality before actually starting to distribute through transfers and taxes. So essentially, either returns to capital became more uneven, or capital became more concentrated, or, very likely, what happened is that wages became more unequal. So this is the underlying force of inequality, or maybe globalization, which pushes inequality up with the nation states. But then you, of course, reduce that inequality first by giving social transfers, redistribution through pensions, unemployment benefits, and so on, and then direct taxation. So then I would like you to focus on the difference between the red line and the blue line. In the case of the United States, you see them going more or less parallel. The implication of that, you have the underlying forces of inequality pushing the envelope, as it were, and then your redistribution policy doesn't change in, the in, in intensity, so you essentially have final income, which is actually after-tax income, following more or less the same as, the, uh, uh, as uh, market income goes up. Or you have a different situation illustrated here by Germany, where actually the role of the state becomes more important, so that the blue line does increase, but doesn't increase in step with the increase of the red line. So that's essentially the message that the countries themselves, although they are uh, 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 sort of facing similar forces of globalization and underlying increase of inequality, do have a policy space. So it is not all predetermined simply by technological change and globalization. Sometimes I'm being sort of accused that actually I privilege the explanation of globalization, and I still believe that globalization was the key factor, and maybe during the Q&A I would have a chance to explain why I believe globalization was so important. But that does not mean that other forces, including policy and technological change, did not play a role. I actually believe that the three of them, which in my book I called English acronym, is very easy because it is technology, openness, and policy, so it's easy to remember that it's actually TOP or TOP, uh, were the three forces that pushed inequality up. Then I come to the between uh, national inequalities, and I promise you I will come also to global inequality, but it is, it's going to take a few more minutes. Uh, then we, we, I come to uh, uh, between national inequalities. So this is the inequalities that I mentioned minutes ago between the countries. Now here, what I like, I mean, the, the way that I think it's very useful to represent them is to actually take here on the horizontal axis your position in your country's national income distribution, and then to contrast, to actually ask, where are you in the global income distribution? So this graph has the, has the US here first, and I will show you in a minute graph for the Netherlands, but suppose that since we are now in John Adams Institute, let's suppose we are like Americans, and we ask you, what is your income? And then I get all this information that I mentioned before, family income, number of family members, uh, tax rates that you pay, the divide, and all that. And let's suppose that I find you that you are at the 80th percentile of the US income distribution. So you are well off by US standards. You're not the top uh, 1%, you're not even top 10%, but you're what we may be called upper middle class in the US. And then I ask you, and that would be the same thing in the Netherlands, I ask you, where do you think you're in a global income distribution? Now, when you think for a moment, if you were to tell me that you're at the 80th percentile, that would be rather unrealistic, because we know that the Netherlands and the US are rich countries. So if you're at the 80th percentile in the US or the Netherlands, you're likely to be at a higher percentile worldwide, because you have to account for many people who are very poor. So if I draw the line here, as you can see, I would go up to almost like, I think, 98th percentile in the world. So that's what this graph shows, that even if you're very poor, American here, you may be, and rightly so, may be unhappy with your position compared to the other Americans, but you're better off than about half of the world population. So you're above the 50th percentile or the median position. 
And then obviously every other richer American percentile is also richer compared to the rest of the world. And that uh, sort of uh, 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 graph then really becomes very, I think, actually powerful in highlighting the position of rich countries and poor countries, because when I do the same uh, you know, uh, graph for countries that are poor like India, the striking fact is not that poorest people in India are also among the poorest people in the world. That's something that we really expect. The striking fact is that actually even people who are at the 80th percentile in India may be relatively poor compared to the Western standards. And I want to highlight this fact because when we discuss inequality within nation states in the West, we are really talking about what is happening in the top 20 to 30 percent of the world population. So there are practically no people that are in sufficient numbers in rich countries in the West who are part of the like lower, I mean, bottom. 70% of the people in the world. So really talking about income distribution, globally speaking, really about the top. And you know, I'll show you very briefly a few other countries. For example, this is China that, as you can see, is obviously at every given percentile richer than India. That, that can be interpreted to mean if you are the 60th percentile in China, well, then you are better off than being at the 60th percentile in India. And as you can see, China's uh, median is around well, it is here, actually. Chinese median is around the world median. Now, this is the data from 2008. And what has happened since then is that both India and China have gone up. So this graph would actually, in more recent data, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the data for China, but I will show you the data for India. Actually, everybody in countries that have grown over the last uh, you know, 10 years, everybody has become better off. And what is remarkable there for China, for example, is that if you take the third decile, for example, of China, and you say, okay, these are people who in 1988 were better off than approximately 20% of the world population. Well, now they are better off than 45% of the world population. So what has happened is that uh, the Chinese have sort of leaped frogged over like a billion and a half of people who were ahead of them. And in that sense, that what I call it, it was the largest reshuffle of incomes since the Industrial Revolution. So it's important to realize that we are really living in a very, a very sort of unique, and to use the Chinese analogy, very interesting times as well, uh, where actually you do have an incredible change in the relative positions of the people in the world. Those who used to be very, very poor have now moved towards the, the middle. But also some people who were in the middle have slid down. And even some people from the rich countries have actually lost their relative position. And if that kind of development continues, then obviously we would expect more and more of that reshuffle to, 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 uh, keep, to, to keep on happening. This is the position of Russia that, uh, you know, it's, it's higher than China. But it is also interesting that if I take China only as urban China, that actually China, uh, the graph, would look very much like Russia and be even actually higher than Russia. And finally, this is a country which is very unequal. I could have taken South Africa, where actually you have that country mimic or span the world. You have uh, 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 people who are very poor by world standards living in that country, but you do have a middle class, which is at 70th, 80th percent in the world, and you have people in that country also at the global top 1%. So this is how really the, the uh, differences between countries get reflected in a, uh, uh, when you put them all, all together in a single global graph. So this is the same thing. I will spend only five seconds on that. But the reason why I wanted to bring it up, because I wanted to highlight, these are data from 2011, much more recent. I would like to highlight, for example, the fact that India now is essentially shifted up and as you can see, the top of the Indian distribution is now reaching almost to the global top 1%. And it's also important to, to realize that the number of people who are at each of these percents in India is very large. We are talking about 12 million people in each percentile. So the, you know, the, the, the average income of those people is already at the very top, uh, I mean, 
reaches 1% of people in India are now almost reaching the, the global top 1%. So this is this dramatic change which we are observing, particularly between uh, Europe and the rich world in general versus uh, rising or what Angus Madison called uh, insurgent Asia. But the striking thing still is how rich, of course, is the rich world when you compare it with poorer countries. And here I've, got, of course, taken the Netherlands and a number of African countries where you actually have a situation that even the top part of the income distribution in some of these African countries does not reach the lowest level, lowest percentile in, in the Netherlands. And you might have noticed if you kind of uh, look carefully and compare this slide with the previous slides that actually the bottom of the, uh, of the Dutch income distribution is higher than the bottom of the American income distribution. That's something that we of course know that in European countries, continental European countries, the bottom is better off than the American bottom, than actually the two become equalized towards the middle of the income distribution, then the Americans become better off and richer, and that's why you have 12% of Americans in the global top 1%, but in Western Europe we are talking about 6 to 8% of people from the you know, top 6% of those countries being part of the global top 1%. Now, after having a sort of, uh, sort of divided global inequality, I would actually now uh, complete my sort of presentation by just now talking about the topic of our tonight's conversation is global inequality. I have defined it before and let me then, if you ask me, how has global inequality changed historically? Uh, obviously we don't know and we don't have the data from the 19th century which really compares with the data that we have now. And I can tell you, even with the data that we have now, we have many problems. So for the 19th century, it was obviously much worse, and we didn't have any data then. It's simply that we are actually working on archival research and guesswork now. Now, I'm using the blue line. It's from a paper by, in, in early 2000 by Francois Bourguignon and Christian Morrison, who did a paper, which is actually a seminal paper in that respect. And what you notice that this is the Gini coefficient, again, measure of inequality, and here is the time. You notice of course that the global inequality has been rising and reached the peak around probably the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, the, the, the forces behind that were the forces of industrial revolution that set on a path of sustained growth one part of the world, the rich, what became later the rich world, and then uh, uh, in the same time India and China practically had no growth or actually had a decline. So that was really the force behind that, much more than changes within each individual country. But now we are witnessing, and this is my data with Christoph Lackner, we are witnessing a change. So this is as dramatic a change, or maybe even more dramatic because the, the time span is shorter, as was the first Industrial Revolution because we are now having a decline in global inequality, but it's driven by the fact that, that uh, heretofore poor countries in Asia are now growing much faster and rejoining what you might call something like the global middle class. So we are really in that sense in a very, as I mentioned before, very unique period because we are now having to some extent undoing of the first sort of technological revolution. And I will not talk about that now because it's much more discussed in, in the book, but you know, to some extent, we are seeing exactly the opposite effects of the first technological or industrial revolution. While the first uh, industrial revolution led, for example, to deindustrialization of India because of cheaper, much cheaper production of textiles in Western Europe and industrialization of, Euro of Europe. We are now seeing actually deindustrialization of Europe, industrialization of Asia, and movement of Europe into services. So we are really seeing developments which are to some extent like a, a reflected in a mirror, but they are also reflected in what we see in global income inequality. And that's where the, I think that this decomposition into between and within becomes very useful. Now, for simplicity, I called within class inequality and uh, between 
countries, location. Why location? Because really your income is largely then determined by where you are born, not necessarily whether you're a rich uh, Dutch person or a poor Dutch person, because if everybody in the Netherlands is relatively rich globally, then really location would be very significant uh, component of global inequality. And the interesting part here is that in the mid-19th century, to the extent that we have the data, as I mentioned, with caveats, lots of caveats about this data, we actually have the situation that about half of global inequality is driven by, uh, by class, which means within national inequality, and half of that is driven by location. That means that the uh, that, uh, sort of contradictions or the contrast between uh, people living in the same country between, let's suppose, workers and capitalists, peasants and landlords, or whatever other distinction you want to make, were a significant determinant of global inequality. Well, that has changed, as I said before, by the, by the end of the 20th century, where actually location was extremely important. In other words, the very fact that somebody is born in the Netherlands gives him or her a stream of income which is many times higher than if the same person is born in a poor country. And that's actually reflected in the incredibly large share that location takes in explaining global inequality. Location basically means citizenship. And, but what is now happening is that with the rise of Asia, that location component is being shrunk. And then if you project it forward, we will actually probably have the decline of global inequality thanks to the shrinkage of the location component and to e sort of greater evenness in the distribution of uh, economic activity, if you will, in the world, but we might have, unless we check further increase in inequality within nation states, we might have an increase in the class part. And in that sense, that's why I actually put Marx and Franz Fanon in the title, because that world here is, although Marx did not know the data, because uh, you know, the data were not, uh, you know, we, we made up these numbers only 100 years after Marx, but the, the, the picture of the world that he had is not wrong at the time when he wrote Das Kapital, because most of, well, half of inequality was inequality due to uh, uh, differences within nation states. But that picture of the world was, is very different from what was happening in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, or even 1990s, where location was so important. That's why I took Franz Fanon, and for people of my age who remember you know, Mao and his sayings and so on, you would remember that Mao actually did exactly the same thing. He talked about global proletariat, which in his view was Asia, Africa, and Latin America, versus the global bourgeoisie, which was the West, essentially. But that was the picture of the world where location is predominant. Uh, and now we may be moving to a, to a situation which at the end maybe of the 21st century might resemble the situation that existed in the 19th century in terms of inequality. That does not obviously imply that income levels are the same because nowadays obviously they are many times higher. So I will finish then with, without talking about the, the technical issues. I would just finish with the, uh, uh, let me just finish with the elephant graph. This is a nice graph, but I've already man, uh, explained that. I would like to finish with, this, with uh, as Casper nicely pointed out, the, the, the elephant graph. The elephant graph uh, is really, to some extent, the summary of all these changes in a yet different way. Uh, and what it does, it actually takes position of people in the income distribution from the poorest percentile in the world to the richest, which is this famous top 1%, but on a global scale, and then ask the following very simple question. Show me what was the rate of growth between 1998 and uh, 2008, or even in a more recent update uh, until 2011, at these different percentiles of the income distribution. So what we already know from what I said and what your intuition would lead you to believe is that actually, and that was also sort of reflected in the data, is that people who have actually in percentage terms had the largest increases in their real incomes were essentially people from Asia, and I call them from simplicity here the China's middle class. 
Obviously, there is really uh, uh, in much greater number of people. We are talking here about two billion people. And also, one has to be aware that while these uh, uh, increases are very significant in percentage terms, because incomes of these people are relatively low still, they are not that significant in absolute sense. So if my income is you know, uh, $6 per day, then the doubling of that would bring me to $12 per day, which would be still below the poverty line, for example, in the Netherlands. So we have to realize that in absolute terms, these are not uh, very large increases of income, but they are very significant in terms of the previous level of income or in percentage terms. Now, the group, however, which had very little of the increase in percentage terms was a group that was, of course, and is still much richer than, as you can see, they are at the 80th percentile of the world income distribution, so they're much richer than people who are at the 50th percentile, but they didn't have much growth. And then when you look at who are these people there, you find essentially rich countries, lower parts of their income distributions, and in particular, I would like to single out because they are very sizable, big countries, US, Japan, and Germany. And then when you look at their bottom 50% of the income distribution, you receive very little growth. For the US, we know that Although US does actually better than Japan, where growth was quite uh, close to zero, and actually does even better than Germany, where growth was in the single digit numbers, cumulative over the entire period. And these three countries, as you know, the three of them uh, represent almost half a billion people. So the bottom halves of their income distributions are 250 million people with very little growth. And then, of course, the top of the income distribution is people who are the global top 1% with very large relative increase, and more importantly, very large absolute increase because their incomes were very high to start with. So this is essentially the, the picture, and I will stop at that point, the picture of the changes which have happened between 1988 and 2008 or 2011. Now, the, 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 the only effect, uh, uh, well, not, not the only, but the effect that you see of the global financial crisis is to have made this point here even uh, more significant because while the global financial crisis lasted in the West, countries of Asia have continued growing. So over like seven or eight years, their incomes have increased even further. So actually these gains, the gains of that middle group have become larger and the middle group is slowly or actually moving towards higher percentiles because there is lots of churning or lots of shuffling which happens behind this uh, graph. And then we have also had uh, lower growth rates for the very top because the very top is still overwhelmingly represented by the top income distributions from the rich countries and these people have had actually relatively bad period because as you know between 2007 and 2010 the top of the income distribution lost quite a lot in terms of uh, income from capital and even income from top salaries. So that was the, the uh, some change in the between 2008 to 2011 but the essential features of that are unchanged and I think these essential features actually are very useful for us because they give us in a nutshell the picture of you know, dramatic alternations in economic positions in the world and obviously, and I will not expand on that because it is pretty clear that it, it raises the issues of uh, uh, democracy, populism, the role of plutocracy and the global top 1% and of course it highlights a very difficult position of the, the groups of the, which are at the 80th percentile of the world income distribution that they're feeling, they're sort of being squeezed between possible competition of significantly poorer people from Asia, but people who are actually whose incomes are increasing, and uh, domestic or national top 1% that is actually doing very well. So in a nutshell, I think it sort of summarizes uh, many of these political dilemmas, but it certainly does not um, uh, solve them, nor does it actually by itself provide an answer to what one should or what we should do in the future. So I think actually on this um, sort of uh, slightly sort of agnostic note, uh, let me finish my presentation. And of course, I will be very happy to sort of continue with, with the questions and answers and also to be, to, I'm sure that uh, Kasper would have also other, you know, difficult questions for me to, to answer. So I would like once again to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Now, Mr. Milanovic, thank, thank you very much for all this. Um, while I was sitting there, I was thinking maybe we should do this the following way, because you actually present in your story um, three different uh, classes and in different places of the world. We can see them here, say China's middle class, the US lower middle class, which I think also maybe encompasses a country like Britain, and, and you might even see it in continental Europe, and this, this, this plutocracy, which sort of is balancing on the tip of the elephant's trunk. So maybe we should... Not of the iceberg, I call it. Uh, well, <laughs> that's, that, that depends on your political perspective, whether you, where you want them to be. But um, maybe, we should, maybe we should consider those in a, in a, in a bit more detail. Mm. Because if I, if I take this rise of this um, middle class outside the West, I could take that as an argument saying, well, um, the rest of the world is now taking care of itself, they're growing, right. so from a Western European perspective, I can now sort of recline and worry about my own country rather than what's going on elsewhere in the world. Is well, I think it is true, actually, and uh, uh, the, if you define global middle class, however you define it, that has actually increased in size and it has increased in percentage because, of course, the world has become also more, there are more people in the world today than 20 years ago. But not only has the, have the numbers of the middle class gone up, it's actually the share of those people that we can call global in the middle class. So it is true that the parts of the world, essentially Asia, you can say are definitely taking care of themselves. And I would like to also mention that, you know, many people of my generation remember, for example, when Asia was considered even by Nobel Prize winners like Gunnar Myrdal, who actually wrote the Asian drama, a book, really considered that uh, uh, it would be very difficult to have an increase in per capita incomes in countries with so such uh, big populations. Well, that has all been proven wrong, actually. Uh, Asia has had, in the last 20 years, or China, 35 years, really a dramatic increase. So you're right, actually, in that sense. However, Asia is not still the, the entire the world. We have countries where this didn't happen, like Africa, where very little evidence of convergence. And, of course, uh, uh, you know, Latin America with a kind of a rather sort of, a, uh, uh, how should I say, uneven convergence and then divergence and so on. Uh, so I would say yes. And that probably makes also, if it is true that, of course, the rest of the world is taking care of themselves, that, of course, makes the domestic issues of inequality then more pressing. Mm. In, uh, in another occasion, I once spoke to a, to a Chinese economist, and then he said, what we are now seeing is basically China reclaiming its right place on the world stage again. The fact that at some point in time, Europe was richer than China is a historical anomaly, and we are now getting back to the way things actually should be and, and have been for most of history. Is, is, that, is, that, more, is that more you're seeing? Yes, here? I would not put the sort of normative aspect in the sense that that's where China should be, yeah, uh, because but... we don't know where it should be. But it's certainly true empirically that that's where China was. And, you know, there are people who work, for example, on comparisons between the Chinese incomes around the you know, beginning of first century AD and then, of course, and between Chinese and Roman incomes. And essentially, we are talking about really absence of really significant differences then. And it's also true that it continued like that until probably 1300 or 1500 or 1700. You know, the, 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 the views uh, sort of vary there. And there was, of course, a period under the Song dynasty of efflorescence in China. So it is true that they are actually reclaiming the place which was theirs. And it's also true what is interesting for economic geography perspective is that we are going to maybe to a distribution of uh, economic power, which would be really if you take Eurasia as a single continent, which basically you can, mm -hmm. uh, then you have really uh, a much greater level of activity in the maritime areas on the Pacific and the Atlantic, which again was historically the case. So yes, we are actually, I think to, say, to that extent, yes, we are actually uh, seeing a, a sort of a, a return to a distribution of economic power which existed in, uh, for a long time, for maybe uh, 2,000 years. And, and, and I mean, the reason I ask this is um, you write in your book that um, the exceptionalism of the peninsular Europe is coming to an end. 
Now, I have two questions. What is, what is the exceptionalism, and, and why is it coming to an end? Well, this is a very good quote, actually, that, uh, that well, it's, you It's from, you your, own, it's from up, your own yeah. book, so I mean, it's, I mean, I didn't make it up. You, you read very it yourself. Very tricky quote. Uh, I, yeah, what I meant, actually, exceptionalism of peninsular Europe is that Europe, of course, became extremely rich part of the world, and that was an exceptional development because, as I was saying before, it was not the case in year 1000, it was not the case in year one, and it became the case in, from probably 15th, 16th century. Of course, the Netherlands is one of these uh, pioneers with of course, northern Italy uh, of the European exceptionalism. So in that sense, I do believe that it is coming to an end. And uh, since you mentioned that, I would like, I always like to sort of quote, I don't remember quoting, I mean, I cannot quote him verbatim because he is much more eloquent than I, but, you know, Gibbon, when he was discussing uh, of precisely the rise of Europe, not in economic sense, but the political and military, he said it would have been a wonder to a Roman to be told that the, the, the riches of India would be controlled by a population from a small island in the northern European sea. And when you see that in that perspective, it is indeed to some extent an anomaly that a very small number of people were able actually by 1950, and by, or already by late 19th century, and then continued until 1950, to control uh, about 60% of the globe. So in that sense, I think it was an, an anomaly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what does that mean, this, that this exceptionalism is coming to an end? And I ask it not just because I'm, because I'm worried for my own future, but there's another thing over, which is hanging over this debate, which is these constant statistics that are being brought up that coming generations actually will be less well off than the previous ones. Is that also a, a hypothesis which your work points to? Well, this is not really because it's simply a factual thing. And uh, we have now the data when we compare, of course, the incomes of the current generation of people young like yourself and others, and then compare that with the incomes of people who were that same age, maybe 30 years or 40 years in some countries in, in, in Europe, that uh, not only are the jobs more precarious and uh, maybe relative position of the young people is uh, worse than it used to be, but even in some cases, then their absolute incomes are less than they were like 30 years ago. So this is, of course, another aspect which highlights, I think, the European dilemma large. Uh, but I think the exceptionalism is a little bit different because exceptionalism is really a broader geopolitical aspect of the distribution of economic activity and to some extent obviously political and, and uh, military power. But you can have the end of the exceptionalism even with improvements of welfare within uh, individual countries. So it's not, uh, you know, in this case the two of them go together but they are actually separate uh, issues I believe. So that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that we, we are becoming poor because of the, uh, the head of the elephant there. No, but you know, many people do. You know, this is the, the tricky part because we know this is the, these are the facts. But you know, drawing co causal explanation from that is, is I, I would say, impossible mm -hmm. uh, if you really want to stick to the rules. But um, many people, when they see that, they see that as an immediate contra possible contradiction between the rise of the middle class in Asia and us, is this rise of the middle class in Asia taking place on the back of stagnation of middle class in Europe? Yeah. And that's something that, you know, the, the elephant graph in its sort of presentation suggests, but I don't think that it is this, uh, uh, the end of exceptionalism in Europe. I would really not put dramatic, uh, uh, it's interesting that you selected it as a, as a quote, but I would not put a dramatic interpretation on that per se. I think that this exceptionalism coming to an end is quite compatible with people in rich countries becoming better off, mm. and young people also becoming better off than the previous generation. So the two things are not, not, uh, not uh, incompatible. Except, and that brings us to the, to the next one in the graph, except if you're part of this US lower middle class, which we now see on the, on the screen. And like, as you said, indeed, this class is not just found in, in, uh, in the in US. The US that's true. There is a, a, a global uh, lower middle class that is basically not seeing any growth of income. And I, I, I think, so. I, you know, I, they, I knew that actually this would bring us, and I would, however strongly I would try to avoid that, but this would bring us to the issue of Trump and Brexit.
uh, because uh, inevitably, we, inevitably we would have to touch on this. Yes. Uh, we cannot, uh, you know, escape from that. But I think it brings us inevitably there. And uh, I, I had uh, sort of on private level discussions with many people. Is that essentially, as an economist and as somebody who has worked on this data, I do see uh, the the sort of the rise of right-wing or generally populism in both United States uh, and Europe as a reflection of economic factors which are really stagnation of real wages of a large part of the population. Uh, other people prefer or actually argue that it's not the determining element, the determining element are other preferences or problems of migration or fear of, uh, you know, whatever cultural uh, differences or maybe some people argue it's racism in the United States and so on. Uh, and I would not discount the second explanation, but I think that we cannot discount the first one. So I'm not sure whether we should give 50-50 to the two of them, but I certainly believe that, uh, that economic explanation has a role to play and that we should not sort of easily discard yeah. it. I mean, but there, yeah, there's, I'm sure there's a, a Nobel Peace Prize to be given away for the ultimate explanation about populism. But... Um, <laughs> What I wanted to ask was the following. Because and economics, maybe, too. Maybe you know, even economics, somebody can get yeah. both of them at the same time. Then, then, <laughs> then you're the real winner, yeah. Um, but what I want to ask, because in your previous slides, you, what you could basically say to those people who are uh, part of the US lower middle class, on a global perspective, you're still, part of the you're, you're still incredibly rich. But for some reason, the economists can say it, uh, we can realize it, but politically, that doesn't make, doesn't make any dent. I think it really cuts no ice, and actually, I've, I've thought that even during the electoral campaign, some people have been saying that, not necessarily with respect to my graph, but generally, you know, uh, I think Annie Lowry, I think, wrote a whole article about that, uh, essentially saying, look, guys, you really, maybe you didn't have any growth, maybe, you know, your jobs are sort of uncertain, and you are not sure if you are going to keep them, but you are really doing extremely well, and you should be, I'm not paraphrasing or maybe exaggerating, but you should be really feeling really, I mean, happy that you have contributed to the real elimination of poverty in Asia. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, a, a common sense tells you that it's not some an argument that actually is going to be, you know, very powerful. So while we might actually, everything else being the same, prefer that there should be fewer poor people, and while I think we would actually be willing to give some part of our income voluntarily to help that cause, to actually argue that, you know, we should not be dissatisfied because something good happened to people elsewhere, it's really politically, as you said, I don't think it really politically works because we are organized in political space, which is a nation, a nation state space. So, uh, you know, this, this is all true, but politically the, the picture is different. And, and it does seem to point to a, say very maybe basic fact of human nature that it is important that you go ahead from one year to the other, that, that you grow. I mean, your, your position on the global income scale basically doesn't mean much to people, they just want more the next year and, and slightly more the next year thereafter, otherwise yeah. they, they get it satisfied. So in, in that sense, you also reveal a psychological makeup of the, of the human being here. Absolutely. I think there are two things there, actually. We are sort of ideology of, you know, growth or development and so on has been so strong, I think, by now ingrained that we really expect uh, steady increases in real income of maybe one or two percent per year, really forever. And secondly, uh, uh, we re oh, I think it's also a second part of human nature that we compare ourselves to within the frame of people with whom we interact. So uh, we compare ourselves to other people, in this case from the United States, or the Netherlands, or France, or whatever, or Chinese to China, much more, and understandably so, much more than to other people from different countries. And I think it is changing, and I think it is one of the explanations behind migration, and we even have empirical data showing, for example, that within the European Union, the comparators are no longer only the, the people from your own country, but also from the European Union as a whole. So things are changing. Nevertheless, the main frame of reference, I still believe, is the nation state. Excellent. That brings us, because you mentioned the, the interaction who an, an individual interacts with, that, that's going to bring us to the, to the, 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 the global 1% and the, and the top of the trunk, um, which I've got one or two short questions about. After those two questions, I'd like to maybe open up the floor to the audience already for two or three 
uh, first questions to Mr. Milanovic. So if you've got your question in mind, um, I'll, be, I'll be with you in, in, say, two or three minutes uh, for two or uh, three questions. And I would be questions. brief, too. Very good. Um, my question on this, on this global percent, one percent, is because indeed you mentioned the word interaction. The interesting thing is that that U.S. lower middle class, or and, and that goes right. goes for the Western countries as well, actually interacts with with a class which is so much more rich than them within the same political sure. sphere. And we just talked about the rise of populism and and the, the importance of relative growth. I think maybe there's an, something to be said for as well, because you yeah. yeah you just see these people which are right. so far away from you, Absolutely, even though yeah. you are politically yeah. speaking part of the same country. Yeah, and of course these people are very often live, and this is what we have seen now under the name of social separatism, live in gated communities. And actually, it's a several, uh, some pathology which I think in the past used to be studied for less developed countries. For example, I remember 20 years ago there were papers about Brazil where actually the point was that Brazilian rich actually have systematic preference of opting out of any uh, sort of uh, uh, communal financing or community financing of many of things like education, health, and so on, because they pro prefer to provide it privately. So essentially, you have social separatism, unwillingness to pay maybe less willingness to pay taxes and then create your own space, as it were. And I think we see that in the United States. I think very clearly uh, there are, of course, studies in, in geographical separatism. There are studies, of course, uh, showing a percentage of people from the top income groups being in the top universities, which then perpetuate this kind of... They advantage. even marry because they, they already... intermarry. There are actually studies about intermarriage now. There are also studies about the, the fact that, that the same people are also uh, uh, v people with very high labor income and people with very high capital income. So so there are many of these things which sort of uh, uh, corroborate what you, were, what you were saying. But I also would like to just a small detail to mention another uh, difficult issue to deal with when you talk about global inequality is that the rise of the global middle class is certainly a good phenomenon. But you know, the question is actually what does politically, what does it mean politically? Because mm -hmm. within nation state, we actually tend to associate uh, the size of the middle class with more democracy. And actually one of the problems of the Western countries is the middle class is shrinking. But globally, there is no political uh, sort of link between that global middle class and uh, political decision-making again, which is at the level of, of a country. So, you know, even I'm, I, I don't know, I'm a little bit at the loss when, people, when, when I'm asked to explain, is, is the gro growth of the global middle class good? Yes, it is in principle good because people are becoming richer. But does it have a political implication or connotation with the middle class had within are you, are you now calling And for I see a, this is the sign that I should really stop. Yeah. Are you calling for a, for, a, for a middle class international, just like an international pro proletariat, there should be a... Yes, but you know, but I, I just uh, I, I cannot really see it very well uh, in where they would actually express their interest exactly. It could be that they will create new fora where they would do that, maybe NGOs, international NGOs, or something like that. But uh, for me, it's too early to say what what will happen. I'm going to collect a few first yes. questions among the audience. Um, you can either raise your hand or or be the first to walk up to the mic. So. Um, there we go. Well, my proposition would be the following, to, to get uh, two or three first questions in, get them all together, and then discuss those, okay. and then, then we'll open the floor up again. But you will have to remind me then of the question I will, number uh, one. No yeah. worries, I will, I will. <laughs> go ahead, please. Thank you and, very oh, much. And one question, uh, kindly state your name also. Okay, uh, my name is Barbara Kitts. Um, thank you very much for your, uh, your presentation. Um, I've noticed that so far the discussion has been basically on the parts of the elephant from the neck up. And um, you said uh, there were three categories. Uh, I'm interested in the fourth one. That is sort of the tail and, well, the lower part. Um, and I, well, I have two questions. One is um, the low change that we see at the very bottom um, of the global distribution. Mm -hmm. Is that something that has been consistent um, over time if you look further back? And my second question is, do you have any clues as to uh, what should be done in order to uh, lift those people up more than they currently are? 
Excellent. Thank you very much. You. The question over there. Hi, my name is Liana. Thank you for your talk. And also thank you for your question, because this was exactly my question. That's great audience <laughs> interaction. But now I you can... Uh, we haven't discussed can. the biggest part of the elephant right. yet. Um, and I also wanted to add maybe to your question by asking about the, the data itself, because I've used your data set before on inequality. And I think we know little about the, the, the least about um, the most interesting countries, African countries, the poorest countries where inequality is very right. high, we do not have the sufficient data. And maybe in that right. regard, do numbers hide as much as they do tell us? And right. what do you think about the relation between poverty reduction and inequality in those countries? Thanks. Can I take, take these two questions together? Because they, they, they really they, seem they, to go I, very I, well. I think they've, 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 they've the agreed meantime, beforehand. Maybe somebody else can come and be ready for the next question. Uh, yeah, you're right, actually. First of all, we really did not discuss very much what's happening at the bottom. Uh, here I want to mention that what you notice really very small growth at the very bottom is uh, that's what essentially data give you. Uh, there is still growth, as you notice, it's 20% growth. These are very small amounts. So I think that the, also the measurement error plays quite a role there because we are talking really of, of people who are earning, you know, this famous one or $1.9 dollars a day, which is the new absolute poverty line. So whether the, the incomes rise by, you know, a couple of cents uh, per day or not, it's very difficult to, to establish. But nevertheless, it is true that actually at the very bottom, we have had not much growth. And then as you move towards, uh, like, practically after the 20th percentile or 30th percentile, you do actually see much more important growth. Now, who are the people at the bottom? Many of them are actually from very poor African countries, and that leads me to the you know, next question in, in terms of data, because I don't want to take all this time because I can talk about the data and problems that we have with many countries, but the problems are indeed, as the, uh, you know, the, the, the question was asked, as the lady asked the question, are the most severe in the poorest country? You know, this is actually to some extent ironic because where we actually need uh, to some extent uh, the best data, we have the worst data. And the reasons are twofold, and I was actually involved, I worked a little bit on Africa as well. The reasons are twofold. One reason which is very often given is institutional weaknesses of statistical offices and all that, which is all true. But it's also true that Africa and less developed countries in general are more difficult to work in uh, or work on or work in, not only because of the data issue, but because the nature of the economy is not entirely uh, monetized. So if you don't have fully monetized economy, it, it is much harder and there is greater element of judgment how you're going to estimate uh, so-called consumption in kind or income in kind. So in other words, when I have lots of self-employed people and people who actually whose income is made out of their own production, I have to estimate the value of all of that. And that becomes really very difficult. And that becomes very difficult also because the, I remember actually uh, harmonizing uh, data for four African countries. Because the number of categories is immense. Mm. You know, you start with everything, like different types of seeds, different types of, you know, uh, grains. Everything has to be then monetized. And, uh, you know, fully, mo I mean, an economy's dream is a fully monetized economy, which every transaction, this is really, I'm taking the extreme case, but it's true, where every transaction would be fully monetized. You go and your friend washes dishes for you, you pay them one euro, that's an economy's yeah. dream, because we immediately have this and we know how much services you have yeah. used. But in m many countries, that's not the case. And um, uh, we do have actually problems with Africa. And I didn't show that here, but I have this slide. Africa is, in terms of population, underrepresented compared to any part of the world. Part of the question was also, what can be done about that? About well, then, I, I would not go into that. It's really something which is a very difficult issue. I mean, an easy way to say uh, growth should be higher. You know, but that's kind of an obvious thing. The question is actually how do you make growth be higher in Africa than it is now? And uh, uh, I'm not totally pessimistic because when, again, when I look at the mistakes that we economists have made with respect to Asia, and I see relatively favorable signs in some African countries, for example, we take single out, for example, Ethiopia, which had like a double-digit growth rate and a very high growth rate now for about 15 years. Uh, you know, we might actually have 
a change, significant change in Africa in the next 50 years. But, uh, you know, perhaps we will not. Another cop-out answer is to say that they, there should be better institutions, but it's very difficult to know how to make institutions better. Let me then, let me then sneak the question back to the, from the tail to the, to the trunk again. Um, what can be done to maybe have the elephant lower its trunk a little bit? Because in your book you do raise some suggestions toward that direction. I think that is actually an easier question because maybe we have researched that more or maybe we know more how to uh, sort of tax and reduce the top incomes rather than are we able to know how to increase bottom incomes, yeah. which is probably an unfortunate development, but it seems still seems to me to be the case. Uh, obviously, when it comes to the top, we do have uh, sort of things, which obviously taxation policy, but also something that I uh, don't want to now talk at length, but I think the equalization of both human and financial capital, or in other words, what I've shown before, this graph where you see the market income inequality rising, and it is rising partly because people's assets, be them human assets or financial assets, are very heavily concentrated. So if policies were to try to equalize human assets, which means really better access to education of same quality for everybody, and a, a reduced concentration of financial assets, we would have been able, we would be able to reduce the, 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 the head or the trunk. Uh, you very specifically top. also mentioned inheritance because yes. the, what, what happens at the top percent is it's rich people passing it on to their children who then are immediately again at that particular... I think actually, and we have seen the studies by Chetty and, and uh, the co-authors, we do definitely see a really uh, tendency for greater and greater, I think, exa uh, exacerbated tendency to uh, 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 sort of uh, carry on with high incomes across generations. And I think I've talked to people, actually, we even have a, I mean, ironically, we have a grant from a very rich person to actually study that, but uh, people <laughs> are uh, uh, very concerned that, particularly in the United States, it goes really against the deeply ingrained view that the US is a society with equal, relatively equal opportunity, and it's a society, to use famous economist Joseph Schumpeter analogy, where maybe at any, any given night, you have lots of, like he, he used the analogy of a hotel. He said, look, in a hotel, at any given night, you have lots of people who are on the floor, some people on the first floor, on the, on the ground floor, some on the first floor, some on the second, maybe some on the 10th floor. But over time, people from the 10th floor go to the 6th floor, people from the ground floor go to the 4th floor, so there is really movement. But if we now move to a society where people who are on the 10th floor never descend down and people from the bottom never ascend up, then obviously we would go very much against, as I said before, which is really deeply ingrained American view, that even if we have inequality today, that inequality would be, would be accompanied by equality of opportunity and different people will go up and down. I understand. Is there anybody else who would like to address a question to Mr. Milanovic? Uh, my name is David Vermeijs. Uh, uh, maybe a bit more technical questions about the graph. Or one observation is that there's none of the observations are below zero. There's, so there's no group that has actually lost over those 20 years. Um, I don't know if there's something you can or want to say about that. My second question um, is if you measure this over 20 years, um, you know, if there's one group persistently getting more um, of the income, they should move up. Right. in terms of where they are in the percentile? Or are those effects uh, nat natural? Uh, I mean, excellent questions. Let me start with the second one because that's something that you know, quite a few people have raised. And of course, I present a, a sort of a uh, easier version of the graph. Now, the, the sort of more accurate version of the graph is this one, uh, where actually you keep people uh, these are really the units are country deciles. You keep country deciles at the position where they were at, uh, uh, in 1988. So what you then have, you actually don't let the Chinese who were at the 30th percentile go up in the income distribution. You look at what was their growth rate at that point. And actually then what you get, of course you get the heterogeneity of growth rates, so they're all over here, and this is a, a sort of non-parametric 
regression, and that's why we call it quasi non anonymous, because it's not fully non anonymous because we don't follow the same people, but we follow the same country decile. So that's the technical answer. As you can see, the results are generally very, you know, very similar. And actually, it was interesting that there, the, the bottom, actually, so the bottom people, actually, when you look at this, they had some growth rate, actually more significant than in the first graph. And the reason for that is because in the first graph, you also have people who were not at the bottom, but who were a little bit above, who, who actually fell down. So that also answered your question, that while we don't have a negative growth in any of these groups, within heterogeneous, groups are heterogeneous, and within groups there is negative growth. And also when, I don't know if I have this slide here, when I, I'm afraid or not, when I do it by percentiles, then you have some percentiles here that are negative. So it, is, it does not mean that everybody has become uh, better off. It doesn't mean that even each country diesel has become better off. But it means when you aggregate them according to the position that they had, there is no negative growth, except really, in, I think there is like one or two percentiles over here. And of course, the more, uh, how should I say, the more you slice the data uh, narrowly, the more likely are you to find some negatives. But really, there are really relatively few negatives, which of course shows that, of course, that period was overall, uh, you know, period of, of, of growth. Uh, and if I can just say one thing, actually, yeah, I, I was asked that by, uh, by Krugman, who actually gave me this idea. He said, okay, this is your, I just draw it differently. This is the elephant, which I've, which I've shown you. Now, we don't have really very good data for the previous period. That was based on Bourguillon Morrison data, 1992. Now, what you notice here, there was no, there was actually basically the growth rate was not very different depending on what part of the income distribution you were. So there is a difference in the two periods. That was one of the questions. Do we really have a difference between the previous period and this period? Yes, we have really because we have this very strong growth over here, and then we have really this absence of growth over there. But in the previous 20 years, we had more or less the same rate of growth throughout. Yeah. Is there anybody else who would like to address Mr. Milanovic? Sir. You showed a graph of the United States in comparison with Germany, and I was wondering what Germany, because I saw, uh, yeah. is it Western Germany, Eastern Germany, I also saw their policy implications that can be learned from that Yeah, graph. yeah. well, in, in that graph, actually, the, the, the current Germany simply projected backwards, and, uh, 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 well, not, f uh, because, uh, actually, the, the, Western Germany of the past and the current Germany are considered like one country. So it is true that actually after, you know, before 1989, uh, it actually includes only Western Germany. Now, the, the policy implication, I don't want to go to be too specific, nor do I know actually German policies well. And as we have seen before, actually German bottom of the income distribution did not really do very well. But what I wanted to suggest in a graph like that is that, uh, that uh, the policy per se can counteract to some extent, that very rising, uh, I, I forget which color it was, you know, but the market income inequality. So in other words, if you have this a rising market income inequality and you just keep policies as before, your after-tax inequality will be parallel to that. Would just simply match that? But if you become more active, then you may be able to actually have more of a flat change at a disposable income level. Or maybe after tax. You should mention maybe, <coughs> which I, I thought was very striking and interesting, what the, the, the German subtitle of your book is. Ah, yes, the, the German subtitle of, of my book is uh, uh, Globalization, Migration, and the Future of the Middle Classes. Which, just which I think is a very good title. Very specific yeah. German preoccupations, yeah. which, which are also addressed then by this book. Yeah. Um, Tracy. Yes, I was intrigued by your slide in which you showed the relationship between class and location on uh, the, uh, the future of inequality. And in 2050, it seemed that the influence of class really rose. Why is that? Well, it's, it's a very good question. There are always only good questions tonight. Uh, it's a good question because uh, this is obviously guesswork. We, you know, it's on the assumption, and actually this is not my uh, work. This is actually a work of uh, the projections are done by uh, by uh, uh, two Peterson Institute economists, uh, Hildebrandt and Paolo Mauro. 
and uh, they assume continuation, of course, of inequalities within nation states. Now, if this doesn't happen, then the gray part, the class part, would remain the same as it is now, and the other part, the, the uh, uh, red part, would actually shrink. So we would actually continue with the decline of global inequality. So uh, in my opinion, actually, that's a very likely scenario. I would just really see the shrinkage of the location component continuing, uh, even if China kind of slows down in terms of growth, because we forget, you know, Vietnam is growing very fast, Thailand, Indonesia, India. So, you know, they will, I believe, continue. Yes, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you've shown us a lot, so, uh, a lot of statistics on uh, both within and between and global inequality um, over the past century. Um, but I feel that you have not really touched upon the normative side of inequality. So I have two questions, basically. First, um, how do you feel about inequality? Is it a good or a bad thing? And then secondly, what, uh, and in respect to that first question, what goals should we be working towards? Can I go one by one now? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. No, I mean, this is, this is, this, I think this is, this is the most crucial question of the evening. I mean, Okay, I would, uh, okay, let me, uh, that's, a, you know, that's a difficult question, it's actually there because we have not only to kind of uh, uh, give our view or, you know, or based on the reading of literature and so on, but also to, to uh, how should I say, divide or focus first on national inequality and then on global. Now, on national, I would say that when you ask me very sort of specifically what is the view on, about inequality, I would say that I, would, I, see in, uh, I don't see inequality as, and it is not a binary variable. Either we are unequal or we are equal. Inequality is a continuum. So you have actually different levels of inequality. And I think that we could argue, we could say, I think with pretty high level of confidence, that very low level of inequality is probably not very good because it really does not give incentives to work, contribute, uh, you know, study, uh, invest, and so on. So very low level of inequality where you basically have incomes determined by, by demographics. Actually, there was a Czech uh, uh, sociologist, Jerzy Wiecernik, who in the 1990s, actually, Czechoslovakia always had, or Czech Republic and Slovakia, had extremely even distribution. Even now, they are among most equal OECD countries. And actually, he had very nice empirical things in the 1980s, showing that actually income distribution in Czechoslovakia could be protected totally from demographic characteristics. So essentially, number of people in a household and the age. So, and then basically the wages, everybody at a given age gets more or less the same wage, then you have child benefits, then you pension, and then essentially it's all entirely demographic. And that, all, I don't think it's a, it is a good strategy, and it was shown not to have been a very good strategy. So that's for really very heavy inequality, or low inequality. But then the other extreme of very high inequality, in my opinion, is not very good for reasons that we all know. It leads to sort of continuation of the privileges over generations. It also leaves aside large segment of the population who don't have an, uh, an opportunity to actually study or contribute. It's a little bit like, it seems to me, it's a little bit like high inequality. It's a little bit like discrimination of women, for example, in some countries. Because you essentially say, okay, this part of the income distribution, I don't care about them. They cannot contribute anything. So that's, that's very similar. So I would say, obviously, I would, I would see the optimal level of inequality in between. Now, I cannot tell you exactly what that number should be, but I think this is kind of a, uh, an idea that we should have in terms of our heuristic approach to inequality. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part is about global inequality. The interesting part there, and I will be very brief, is that um, the basic question, should you really view, as Rawls did, uh, 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 optimal inequality as the, as the uh, sort of a summum or summa of national inequality. So in other words, in the world that Rawls had in mind, you actually work on equalizing incomes within your own country, and every country does that the same, and you totally discard or disregard the component of between inequalities. Because in Rawls' view, that really doesn't matter. If the Netherlands is richer than Sri Lanka, it's irrelevant. They're both liberal society, democratic societies. It doesn't matter at all. 
And, or do you actually try to do something to reduce this between national inequalities? So I think this is really a kind of a dilemma, and I think that one uh, alternative, one pos position is that you, do, you see optimal global inequality simply as a summation of national inequalities, as he did. And I think a different perspective would be more cosmopolitan, where you would see uh, some reduction of global inequality also coming, as it is coming now, through actually reduction of between inequalities. Mm. That's, that, that brings me maybe to what would be uh, uh, also a wrap-up question. Um, you really argue for a global perspective on an issue like this, inequality. Um, at the same time, I think many people indeed say so, we are entering maybe an age of deglobalization. Uh, uh, yeah. Is it still possible in a time of America first and then lots of European countries mimicking that to where is the room to argue for the global view? Well, I think that, that the global view, uh, first of all, you know, as you have seen, actually I've divided it and it's, uh, into, you know, within, national, and between. And it's not uh, only a mere sort of convention or mere arithmetics. If you do that as, as, as mere arithmetics, then it's really kind of not particularly useful. But behind that are, 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 are political and social forces and the issues, uh, last question, for example, was the issues how you grapple with global inequality. Now, when it comes to that, I am not as pessimistic because I believe that the current setup of globalization is fairly resilient or robust. Uh, so that undoing that is, is I think, fairly difficult. And I, I believe that we already see that in the case of Trump, where actually he called, of course, China currency manipulator three months ago now. There, he's saying they are not currency manipulators. Then they were actually pushing the exchange rate down. Now they're pushing it up. So, you know, there, you know, we are seeing this. Uh, we also see the technicalities, for example, of Marine Le Pen saying that she would have the referendum on the, on the, on the euro and uh, that probably would not only, regardless of the outcome, that probably would lead uh, to the run on the banks and the issue of banking stability to start with. So I don't think that this is easy to undo what has been done in the 60 years. So I'm not, uh, or, or I'm not as, uh, as pessimistic. And I think we will have now, it's maybe a uh, bump on the road, uh, but maybe it's a little bit bigger bump on the road, but it will be still a bump on the road. And I think globalization is here to stay because it is simply th this context which exists, the trade which exists is really not going to be, to be sort of interrupted. And uh, China with its own contribution for you know, investments, international investments and so on, I think are, is giving a huge contribution to globalization. Very well. Mr. Blanovich, um, three things are going to happen. Um, the first is that I'm going to be recommending your book to the audience tonight. I have read it. Um, it's, it's, it's a very good read. It's a very good Dutch translation as well, very beautifully published. Uh, uh, many more themes in the book than we've also been able to touch on tonight. That's the issue true. of migration, for instance, we couldn't touch right. on a lot about that in the book. So, indeed, it is also for sale today. So, I do recommend you to, uh, to pick up a copy. Um, the second thing is that I'm going to be inviting Tracy to the stage for a few closing remarks about John Adams. And then the third thing is that I'm going to be asking for a very warm round of applause in the audience by th to thank you very much okay. for sharing your thoughts. With thank us. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both, Bronko Milanovic and Kasper Thomas, for this inspiring and insightful evening. Um, Mr. Milanovic's book will be sold outside, just outside the door, and he will indeed be signing. Uh, Cosper's introduction will be on our website tomorrow so that you can reread it at your leisure and uh, reflect on it because I thought it was very good and very deep, as befits the new correspondent of the Financial Dagblad. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to mention to you two of our upcoming events. On April 20th, we have the American author Adam Alter, uh, under the title, My Phone, My Phone, My Irresistible Phone, talking about why it is that we simply cannot stay away from that device, uh, how we get addicted, and how these devices are actually designed to get us addicted. And in addition to Adam Alter, we'll be having a really interesting panel that evening, including Alter himself, Walter von Noritz from NRC Handelsblatt, who on Friday is publishing a book on a related theme, 
Uh, Jan Willem Huisman of the games developer IJsfontein. Games developers, of course, are also interested in keeping us glued to our devices as, for as long as possible. And Marleen Sticker, who is one of the pioneers of internet in the Netherlands. And then on May 1st, we will be reflecting on the first turbulent 100 days of Trump's presidency. We'll be doing that together with the political scientist Thomas Frank with Will Englund, who is uh, a journalist of the Washington Post and was at the Moscow Bureau of the Washington Post for several years, and has just written a book about the 100 years anniversary of the Russian Revolution, and of course is very up to date on all things Russian, um, including their perhaps involvement in the US elections. And in that event, we have also invited Greg Shapiro, whom I'm sure you will all remember as the grab them by the pony voice <laughs> of our president in Arjen Lubach's uh, wonderful video. I would like to invite you to keep up with what the John Adams does, sign up for our newsletter, and do us a favor and forward the newsletter to someone else that you know who you think would also be interested in what we do. And we hope to see you back very soon. For example, next week on the 20th for your irresistible phone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.